been doing Agile development since 2001, and this will be the first Agile conference I've spoken at. So we'll see how it goes, and maybe it'll be the last. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I've made the cardinal sin of forgetting to set up my uh, presenter display. I, uh, I apologize for this. If you just give me a second. Adam, if you'd like to entertain, please. Sure. <laughs> Juggles and things. Uh, I think you're back in the business. So like I said, um, I started, um, I guess, doing Agile uh, in early 2001. Um, I've been teaching test-driven development um, since about 2004 uh, in the US, Canada, and in uh, Europe. I presently work for um, Global Data Center Operations, Rackspace. And I um, recently had my Official uh, job role change, but not my title, to chief engineer for this project. And I lead um, development on um, new systems that we are working on to uh, manage the scale of data centers that we are, uh, that the world is going to uh, in, the, in the next few years, which is extremely large, uh, mostly to deal with the demand for cloud computing and, and hybrid uh, cloud computing solutions. So I'm working on the, on the new development for a new generation of systems um, within the group that runs the software that does um, data center automation. Uh, and that has been um, a, quote, agile team uh, for about five years. And we are, um, process of looking at the work product and realizing that perhaps the result of four or five years of straight up agile development uh, can also lead to the big rewrite. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about our perspectives and my perspectives over the years, how it's changed about uh, test automation um, and how that has led, I think, to um, a much more um, enjoyable perspective on test-driven development. <laughs> so, let's say that we have a software system that works more or less correctly, for your definition of correct. But it, uh, it doesn't do things wrong. And it has um, pretty good customer satisfaction for your definition of customer. And uh, it's got good automated tests. So let's say one day you simply decided to delete the tests. But the moment you delete the tests, did the system become bad? So you can see that the, the system has something else in it or about it that makes it good, that isn't necessarily in the tests. The tests obviously have a function and support, but there's something about that system that um, is inherently good. So I want to go back to this quote that I had rolling earlier from um, Dr. Deming. You cannot uh, inspect quality into a product, and this is a big hint. This is often said as, um, you might have heard this said as, you can't test in quality uh, and build quality in. And we often call this quality built in. 
But if the first thing that you think of when you think of quality built in is tests and testing um, and automated testing, then you're possibly falling prey to a kind of um, orthodoxy, um, almost a ritual that is cropped up in Agile software development. And uh, to no fault of Agile, I think it's part of the rise and fall of, of methodological trends um, that this kind of thing happens. But if you're in that cycle, um, you might not be exposing yourself to ideas and solutions that are outside of the box um, that uh, delineates Agile from the rest of software development. So here's a, another quote I, I, I quite like from uh, Ezra Dijkstra. It says, testing shows the presence, but not the absence of bugs. <coughs> The absence of bugs is conversely the presence of something else. So back to that thought experiment about what would happen if you deleted those tests. What, be, what is present in the system when bugs are absent? And it's something that you, you can't really write a test for. Um, or something that maybe if you could write a test, the test might not even be meaningful or valuable. And it just simply comes down to this, that test automation isn't always helpful. Um, it's really not helpful when we end up turning it into a ritual or fetishizing it. And um, that's kind of one of the side effects of 10 years of putting a laser focus on test automation. There are secondary effects of using automation indiscriminately. Productivity suffers when we use automation indiscriminately. And it suffers uh, in uh, compounded ways. And there's serious maintenance costs for automated tests when we take them past this point of ideal use, usefulness. And here's why. So, um, say this blue building block here is some module of functional code or capability you're working on. And we add some tests. But every test, every automated test, is a coupling. Because of the nature of the software, its construction, its physics, its geometry, um, costs can increase, ex increase exponentially as coupling increases. Every bit of coupling that you add, you make changing the system more difficult. And to wit, um, test code is fairly repetitive code, and there's a kind of numbing effect that that has on our minds when we're trying to consume a lot of test code. It leads to Test code is the kind of code that is, kind of makes you less alert just by the repetitive nature of it, especially when you're testing permutations of different variables. You want to quickly skim through a lot of test code and you immediately go numb to what you're seeing, mostly because of the repetition. But you know you need to add tests to maintain a certain level of productivity. Or at least you might feel this, and it's, it's a pretty good justified feeling. So we have to reconcile this notion of there's a goodness to tests, and there's a badness to tests, and probably a really good first step is to realize that there is a point um, where if you <coughs> continue to add more automated testing, the costs of almost everything are going to start increasing, and they're going to start increasing faster and faster as you add more. And there's also a point where if you have no testing at all, that the cost of just about everything is also going to be pretty high. Um, and there's a sweet spot right in the middle where you have just about enough automated testing. But 
hit that target, you have to know a heck of a lot about software development and about software design. If you're struggling with these things, you're kind of shooting in the dark as to the um, inevitable question of how much testing and what to test. Um, but there are some pretty good ways to get to that answer. What you want to avoid is this problem that you can get into um, when you believe that the goal is to add more automated testing. Because we're constantly losing productivity. It's this amazing thing about the kinds of industry or endeavors that software or human endeavors that software is. Uh, is susceptible to losing value with the more effort we spend on it. And that's largely because it's invisible. So we're adding something negative when we sit down and do our work. If this were true, we wouldn't be rewriting systems on exactly the same platforms and on exactly the same runtimes every few years. It might make sense that you wanted to go from Java or .NET to some space age technology that we haven't conceived of yet, but rewriting the same .NET system on the same .NET platform just because we drove productivity in the ground, suggesting that we're doing something with these systems. And it's something that automated tests aren't helping us with because 10 years of experience with this laser-like focus on automated testing isn't really getting us to the point. So you can say, at least in abstract, without zeroing in on the problem, at least you can say we're adding counterproductivity. And that's a great place to start. But it means that we should also have a pretty good um, idea, perhaps a reconsideration or consideration or reflection about what we think about what productivity is and look at it more from an end-to-end -end perspective um, and consider things like uh, a focus on something like, uh, quote, developer productivity. Um, can very likely be quite unhealthy. Except in circumstances where the, develop it, the developer function or that work step is, has become um, um, so incapacitated or dysfunctional that it needs a tremendous amount of focus. And think about it this way. Every step in the workflow is there to make the next step easier. So we've got to find another element to add. Um, <coughs> but what is it and where does it come from and what is it made of? It's a fascinating thing. Um, it's not made of test automation, but it's made of something that we already have in agile development. But in the end, and going forward, it should come down to you understanding that test automation um, is a choice and not a rule, and when it's practiced as a rule, you can get into some productivity problems. Um, it's a specific tool to deal with a specific problem at a specific point in time. And it's this issue of the point in time that is um, really critical. <clears throat> so rather than just believing that you should start testing right away, we should consider when to start testing. Or is there a way to consider this question? The inevitable answer is kind of naive, but true. It's do it before it's too late. But that's a better answer than do it right now and do it, do it always. Because one of these answers asks you to reflect, and another one of these answers asks you to turn your mind off and stop believing what you're seeing with your own eyes. So when's a good time to start testing? Um, you could say that as soon as you have an assumption that is yet to be proven, and you're about to take that assumption and make it the foundation of yet more work, that would be a good time to consider test automation, or testing, period. And when to start automating, um, same thing. Not too early, not too late. Really, really, really not too early. The problem that we tend to have right now is that we're starting often too early. 
There's an implicit statement in here that, that, that asks you to, um, to think about <coughs> testing and test automation. And take an opportunity every now and then when you hear yourself say testing, whether you're really saying test automation. And ultimately neglecting to consider what testing is. If we commingle the meaning of these things, um, we lose something of, of, uh, of great value. And it's also important to realize, outside of the domain of test automation, that everybody tests. Before we had test automation, um, the wave of test automation that started with extreme programming in the early 2000s, people were still testing. And there are still teams today that don't invest in a lot of test automation that are highly productive and very successful. Even if you're a programmer who hasn't started testing, you more than likely somehow exercise your work, your code, and prove or disprove <coughs> that it works. You might not be doing it very well, and you might not be able to scale your effort, um, and the scaling is what the automation is partly about, um, but it's a little bit uh, disingenuous to suggest that we don't test just because we don't have test automation. And it's one of these biases that have been quite strong in the, in the Agile development decade. So I would like to uh, take a look at uh, this issue of when to start testing from the lean startup uh, perspective. If you're not familiar with this, a Google search on lean startup will reveal uh, an interesting application of lean methodologies to entrepreneurship. Um, the interesting thing about Lean Startup is um, it's not just applicable to entrepreneurship as in starting a Web 2.0 business. It's pretty much applicable to anything that has a beginning or anything that you're going to start. So I don't know if you guys remember this graph from the early 2000s. This graph or something that looked like it was often used to help explain Agile and what its effects are. Where we have the traditional cost, or cost curve, either the cost of present effort or total cost of ownership or maintenance cost, um, increasing exponentially over time and Agile flattening it out. And, and this is, ironically, uh, contrary to the, to the thesis of my talk, um, doing, a, doing a, a, a large part to the stability that um, automated testing uh, brought to software develop, development at large. It's also due to the effects of test-driven development and small batching and incremental development and design. There's a really interesting part about this graph even in the days where we were talking about this graph when it was used in, in books and, and conferences frequently to help introduce the world to Agile before Agile was well known, um, we never focused on something that is, is quite mathematically fascinating about this. Um, and that's this little point right here where these two lines intersect. The intersection of the two lines is where traditional approaches lose the productivity battle to agile approaches. But before this point, it's presumably less costly to use traditional methods. And the question is, how can you reconcile these two approaches? How can you make the switch before it's too late to take advantage of a curve that would look more like this? The Lean Startup body of knowledge and um, body of work identifies two principal phases of the work. Problem development uh, and solution <coughs> development. During problem development, you're working to validate that you're solving the right problem to begin with. Um, the implicit statement being that we often presume too much about what we perceive to be the right problem before we start 
investing resources into a solution. Um, Lean Startup is a fascinating application of test-driven development <coughs> to customers and customer behavior by using metrics um, on uh, customer uses of our applications, um, adoption patterns, um, set-based testing, split testing, and what entrepreneurs typically find is that their best laid plans and the ideas that they hold most dearly to about what makes a good product are often uh, handily challenged by the reality of what the customer wants. And this methodology helps guide entrepreneurs to switch to the things that the customers want then, rather than the things that the developer is fixated upon. <laughs> Lean Startup, you call us a pivot. The pivot could happen, um, it could happen early, it could happen late, it could happen in the middle. Um, the important thing is to know that it's going to happen. You're going to realize something about what your presumptions were and realize that there's another direction to go. The ultimate thing is you have to get good at sensing when that time is. It's not really quite right to say sensing when the pivot is. It really is to get a sense a little bit ahead of the game of when it's coming. So that when you, um, when you're ready to make the change, you're not already behind the curve. Because if you remember from the other graph, the other line starts to spike exponentially beyond this point. And there's a, an application of that to this curve. And when you get past the pivot, you inevitably start investing in software development the kinds of things that you uh, want to have in place to create stability. And those things inevitably are a lot of coupling. That means a lot less ability to change. So we're going to try to defer automated testing until later. But there's got to be some compensating force that allows us to be comfortable with this. Because up until now, the premise has been start testing now. Um, get your systems under test first. You look at it from another perspective. If you do that, you're likely to incur costs that are unnecessarily that are unnecessary that early. So the answer is interestingly enough still found in test-driven development, which is ironic because test-driven development um, is predicated historically on the presence of automated testing and testing tools. And no matter how often it's said, and for how many years, the idea that test-driven development is about design um, has simply had no traction. And because of this, most of its value has really never been capitalized. <clears throat> Inevitably, every time we have a conversation about test-driven development, somehow the conversation backslides into testing, or automated testing. There's a startling realization um, that comes for me and for a few others, a few later, a few years later, which is quite obvious in retrospect, especially when contrasted with uh, other methodological traditions that's, that help support the ideas that um, a good deal of TDD can be done um, without writing tests, without writing them down, without making them automated toolkit-based permanent artifacts of coupling. And, and that's, uh, that's something that becomes possible when you really, really get comfortable with why test-driven development does design, even though it's leaving behind a regression suite.
this is the sort of ultimate foundational principle of all of this, that productivity comes from clarity. And clarity is a quality of design. And what we're missing when we've got large test suites that do exercise the system, but that still people have a hard time understanding, you're missing clarity. And clarity isn't something you get by accident. But the real limitation we face here, uh, because clarity is a cognitive thing, um, is believing that the world of software development can have a level of productivity um, that is much, much higher than what we're currently seeing. And that this problem could be rooted in clarity. And we see this, we see this world of software development, you know, as our ideas are, are are bound up in superstitious definitions of what's possible and what we should be doing. It's this um, notion of, of flat earth thinking, where we can't really conceive of a new realm of productivity because our current worldview has really a real well-defined box around what it is that we do. And beyond that box, you just go off the edge of the world and into the realm of dragons. And a lot of this is based in superstition or orthodoxy. And the hard part of all this is just how much productivity is available um, after breaking through this. So Voltaire is known for this um, oft-repeated quote that perfection is the enemy the good. And uh, I guess in Western Canada, we probably don't have a lot of French speakers inside. Anyone come over from Quebec for this? All right. So what Voltaire said was, le mieux est l'ennemi du bien, which doesn't translate to perfection is the enemy of the good. It translates to the better is the enemy of the well. Which is saying that better is the enemy of the status quo. Better destroys the status quo. The goal, in fact, is perfection. And that's necessary because software is a design industry. Every line of code, everything, it's all designed. It's all invisible. You can't afford design mistakes in software development. And what matters most when you make a mistake is what you do with that mistake. And um, mostly what we're doing now is massively underestimating the cost of mistakes. Because a mistake in software development due to modularity and adjacency spreads out through all of the modules that are adjacent to the mistake. That would be fine if you only made one mistake. But because we allow pervasive mistakes to go unchecked, they are really the foundation right now of our worldview of software development. And that's the necessary thing that's holding us back from breaking through, through our superstitions of ideas that Perfect is the enemy of the good, and lines like what you're doing here is building a Cadillac, and all we really need for this is a Honda. Although Honda is a higher quality vehicle than a Cadillac. <laughs> the problematic thing about this is that we've had a couple generations of software developers who have been separated from soft, the practice of software design, structural design, um, software principles. And because of that, we've got a generation of managers who themselves really didn't like software enough to begin with to learn anything about design such that they ultimately escaped to a management position, which is ultimately the position, the solemn duty of being the master instructor to teach the workers how to be master software designers. 
and the very basis of productivity and effectiveness in software is a little bit of a lost art right now. But it's not forgotten. There are people who still know. We've just sort of gotten away from foundational principles of the work that it is we do. And that's also probably due to the massive explosion of the population of software developers that started in the 80s. And there's a real simple way to deal with this. Well, it's really simple and almost impossible. Um, just challenge what it is you believe. You know, change your religion. It's that easy. But it means, uh, ultimately, oddly, that to learn about software design and structural principles, how they relate to productivity, what quality means, really, what it means, and it's basically a synonym for productivity, you're going to have to start dealing with ideas that uh, feel so counterintuitive to you that they're going to be frightening. Um, as frightening as sailing off the edge of the world. Because what we're saying is, you can't afford any mistakes when you're doing design work. And all software development work is design. And we're lacking, almost completely lacking, foundational skills in software design. And even though agile development has, has done a darn good job of uh, changing the curve, it's really, in the grand scheme of things, relatively small incremental change in productivity compared to the orders of magnitude of improvement that could be made by understanding software design. So here's a couple little uh, things you might want to look into um, just to, uh, if you're having a hard time believing that you can believe things that are um, untrue, or will be untrue in the future. Um, there's a great study from Cornell University called Unskilled and Unaware of It about um, unconscious incompetence or the overestimation of our belief in what we know. And another great book called The Checklist Manifesto that's written mostly by somebody who studies healthcare, um, but wrote about uh, ineptness, which is not incompetence, it's the inability to use the knowledge that we have, that we already have, when faced with things that are truly complex. This is a photo of the interior of the USS Kursk. It's in the, it's in the, um, the Navy Museum in Baltimore. You can go take a tour of it. And what's fascinating about being on a submarine, for those of you who haven't spent your life on a submarine, um, is that the interior of a submarine is uh, an incredible density of controls. Every space in the ship has direct controls for the systems that run through it. So here's how this applies to software development. Um, and to automation and to productivity, ultimately. When you don't have the right direct controls um, for your systems, you lose productivity. Um, and the kind of designs that uh, give you or allow for direct control at any level, in any space, will also make the system easier to understand. And it's because things are difficult to understand that we don't know how to control them. And it's because we can't control them that they become more difficult to understand. And you end up in a, a very quick race to the bottom once you get past this tipping point. Actually, if you turn that productivity curve, or that cost curve down, invert it, you're basically seeing the traditional productivity curve once you get past the tipping point. Another, um, so you end up with this virtuous circle. Um, software designs 
that allow you to control your systems uh, also create a tremendous amount of clarity. And if you want to buy the idea that clarity and productivity are um, inextricably intertwined in a virtuous circle, um, then this is a profound thing to think about. And every time you make a mistake in software development and software design or come up with an excuse for not fixing something that you already know is wrong, you're going to end up with coupling problems. And it's those coupling problems that are going to be the difficulty that you have in directly controlling your systems. So here's an interesting experiment that you might want to try at work that um, I've done with on teams where we've uh, been allowed to do, or we do do pair programming, because it's kind of almost impossible to do on your own without killing your productivity because of uh, all the effort in doing the experiment. Um, but uh, next time you're sitting down to do some work, see if you can pay attention to, or have your pair pay attention to, the time that you spend um, not understanding how to take the next step. If you can tally up the amount of time you spend trying to figure out what you're going to do next and how to do it versus the amount of time you actually spend doing it, um, you'll, you'll probably find some pretty stark numbers, maybe things that are even more surprising than you thought of. You'll see the real story of productivity. So what do we just stop doing then? What do we just stop making excuses for lack of clarity and making excuses for mistakes? And it comes back to this. It's, it's not a small problem because we're a couple generations from widespread knowledge of software design and software development. So let's bring this back to testing and maybe uh, plant a seed. Because even though this stuff is a lost art, it's completely recoverable. And it's, it's fairly trivial principles to understand, to get there. There are really uh, two fundamental processes that are happening in testing. Controlling and observing. We, if you think of, of executing some test, whether it's a manual test or an interactive test or an automated test, you're writing an automated test. Um, you first control the systems, or assemblies, or sub-assemblies, or classes, or modules, or whatever you have. And then you make observations about what you've just done, the effect of the control actions. So from a perspective of testing vernacular in software, um, controlling is the setup. Whether it's a setup in a J unit or N unit, or whether it's the setup that a tester goes through manually. And the observing you could think of as the assertions. The cognitive glitch that we all suffer when we get into the technology aspect of testing is um, we have this great anticipation of what the result of the observations are going to be. This, this is kind of the payoff for us. And our attention very quickly switches from the controlling part of testing to the observation part of the testing. What test-driven development does and is for is it gives you an opportunity to make the control explicit so that you can look at it and see if it's good or not. That's only if you stop and look at it only if you pay attention to the quality of the controls. And it's in the quality of controls that you're going to see the design problems. Fantastically, even if you don't know software design theory, you can learn it by doing this. And I think everybody that I came up with who learned software design along the way started with an understanding, an unconscious incompetence, an overestimation of what we thought we knew about design. And once we started doing test-driven development, everything was just laid open for us. Um, 
And also, we all have, talk, have talked about a great sense of relief. What would we have known if we had not gone through this exercise? What we would have believed about ourselves had we not gone through this exercise? I would still think that encapsulation and inheritance is all you really need to know about design. Patterns became understandable through the exercises of test-driven development. Things that were really just sort of esoteric. You know, I used to think of these guys that would talk about designs, mostly these academics who were sort of, you know, intellectually stimulating each other, summits um, once a year. Um, but it turns out that they are categorizations, catal cataloging, and recording of profound techniques that ensure productivity. So if you take test-driven development forward a few years and apply um, this notion of systems that are under control and controls, and look at the automation program problem and consider what we said about the lean startup methodology, there's still a role for automation here. But it depends where you are in the development life cycle. And I don't mean you're in the first month or the last month. I mean you're working on a feature or a piece of code where you are with that specific work item. If you focus on the controls, you're going to see the design problems. If you automate just the controls first, which is what you do when you write a J unit test or an N unit test or an R spec test or a cucumber test, what have you, there's a certain part where you're writing just the setup code. But early on, you just focus on the setup code and leave it at that, there's a productivity spike that comes out of it. Actually, there's a lot of productivity spikes. There's a virtuous circle that's created when this happens. And we end up closing in on something that lean practitioners already know, that there is great value in semi-automated testing, semi-automated anything. And there's no inherent value in turning everything over to the robots. There's some value, but there's an industrial theory for why you do it. In software development, we tend to find gratification or gain gratification or stimulation from putting software up against a problem. But when you try to have software, design your software, you, you end up having unskilled designers doing the work. Um, robots really aren't very good at designing new products. Yeah. Not intentionally, anyway. So you might end up doing a little bit more of that work that you think should be handed over to the robots. And that's a good thing. So back to Lean Startup, there's two seconds, two sections, product development and solution development, problem development and solution development. You might be able to reflect on your own experience and realize when software is brand new, when a module is brand new, when a problem you're solving is brand new, um, there's more churn in that code. You're trying to figure it out. It's a cognitive issue. Wrapping a whole lot of coupling around code at that point in its time, lifetime restricts your ability to make the changes that you need to make when you have new realizations. Which really suggests that the pursuit of autonomous testing early and automated testing later leads to greater productivity. There's a really fascinating matrix of positive secondary effects that comes of this. One of them is remaining close to the work that you're working on. One of the fascinating things that happens when you explicitly I want to say obstruct. In my team, it had to be an obstruction. We had behavioral changes to make 
after a team that was uh, five years into their um, practice of automated testing. When I suggested to them that we get rid of some of the automated testing and instead do more spot checking, it was really like I had asked them to sail off the edge of the world. Um, and what had to happen was I had to take them on my boat and go around the world to demonstrate that the Earth isn't actually flat. But although you're making a trade-off for automated assertions, for automating the observations, they also learned along the way that I was going to put an emphasis on the automation of the controls so that we could learn how difficult it was or not difficult to control our system at any level of the design and in any space or any disposition or any part of a workflow that the system was in. Spot checking became a matter of using a human being's fantastic capabilities of doing pattern recognition. Looking with your eyes. And as things became more permanent, or we got a sense that we were really on the right track, that this was the way the design was going to be, we would invest in a little bit more coupling. One, for the purpose to document what, we've, what our decisions are. And secondly, to put a little bit of restriction around this stuff. Ironically, it's the code that has been in, that has existed for the longest and has shown itself to work without problems that is the least needy of automated testing. So you'll also see at some point later in this journey, that there's a point later on where you can reconsider whether or not you want to do automated testing on the stable stuff. And it's a choice, it's an exploration. You really need to think about deleting tests. You can't sustain productivity over the long term you just continue to add automated tests. One of the really destructive side effects of automating the, observant, the observations is that you lose familiarity with your systems because you're not um, undertaking uh, purposeful experiences or moments to experience your systems. Stay connected with them. When you stay tangibly connected with your systems, by causing and forcing yourself to do some autonomous testing, you retain a certain level of knowledge and fluency. And I can tell you with all confidence that there are people in this room, not all confidence, all right, most confidence. I can tell you with a certain amount of cockiness, I guess, that there are likely people in the room who have systems that have a lot of tests that are well tested that they do not understand. And one of the ways to stay, to, to, to sustain understanding your systems, which is the secret sauce to productivity, is to continue to be able to interact with them. But if we design our systems in such a way that it's simply not like that submarine where you can interact with the systems directly, you just don't get a choice. That's something that we say, or you can use the term, well, when the term control starts to become fairly interesting in another perspective. Those systems are out of control. Those projects have left your control. Those teams are out of control. The economics of those projects have departed from the control of human beings. You're not in control, you're not in control. That's all there is to it. Let me give you a great example. If you've ever taken a snapshot of a production database, in order that you can do functional testing, that is the testing that just proves that stuff works, not that it works at scale or whatever. If you've ever done this, your system is out of control. If it was in control, 
if you had automated controls and you had designed that was amenable to control, you could disposition the system in the way that you're dispositioning it by using this production data. Because you would have created facilities for that. So we focus a lot on investing automation to dispositioning the systems. But not so much into checking the systems. We rely on ourselves, especially early. Midlife, we put some automated checking around things. End of life, we start to wonder whether we really need to be maintaining all these tests and we consider deleting them. And all of this is inevitably the fundamental issue of, of, of production work, design work. It's an issue of knowledge transfer. Um, I won't be so cocky as to say this is the whole point of, of lean methodologies because I'm not qualified to say that. Um, this is something that I didn't pay attention to as much as I should have before I started trying to understand lean a little bit better and having some aha moments that have been um, somewhat transformative. Knowledge transfer is like the gears in your bicycle or your car or whatever other futuristic vehicle you might have that has gears. The purpose of it is that when you get up to speed and you're about to go into a next stage, that the speed and the momentum and the energy that you built up doesn't fall off. So I tend to talk about this, well actually I don't use the term knowledge transfer anymore because I found that people in my organization and my team and my friends are just kind of cynical to this. And there's good reasons for it. Knowledge transfer is one of those fluffy terms that those guys and girls who escaped the work to go into management use um, as a way to talk about what the problem is. And in fact, it is a really big problem, but um, there's really good theoretical reasons for why this is a problem. Every stage in the process, and it doesn't necessarily mean analysis, design, development. I mean, it could just be person to person. If you have a handoff between a person and another person, even though it's in development, there's process there. If you look at handoffs and exchanges between the people, that's your process. It's not what you have up on your scrum wall with the names of those slots. That's a high level roll up report. The real process is what's going on when you're handing off. If every time you hand off, you lose the speed and the energy, if the one person's knowledge doesn't come with the handoff, and every time you make a change, there's a sawtooth and you drop down, you build back up and drop down, you're out of control. Because control systems are written to be understood. They're written for clarity. And when you get there, you're starting to crack the outer surface of the nut that is keeping us from seeing what I'm suggesting is these orders of magnitude of improvements in productivity. I think a lot of what has to happen um, after 10 years of Agile and five years of Agile orthodoxy is a really, really good reflection and reconsideration of what we believe are the must-have things. And we should be doing this, I think, from the perspective of foundational principles of workflow and knowledge work and um, specifically product development work where we can start to get a, a better understanding of when to use these tools that we have. And there's not, absolutely nothing wrong with um, automated testing. In fact, in, in, in many cases, it's absolute necessity. But we don't truly have a good idea of when to use them as specific coping mechanisms for very specific problems at very specific times. And instead, we're using these things indiscriminately. And even now, it's, it's probably uh, difficult, maybe even for some people in the room, to, to 
bring yourself to even consider that testing should not be done as much as possible, as often as possible. So, I would say, definitely don't take my word for it. Um, it's very possible that I live in a bubble as well. Um, and that this slide deck will be the subject for some future researchers' um, evidence of unconscious incompetence. <laughs> But at the same time, um, there are interesting things to happen just uh, to consider, just by thinking about it, just by looking into lean startup, just by looking into what might be considered waste time. If you, if you measure how much time, well, I'll tell you what. If you spend some time really trying to observe the amount of time you spend trying to figure out how your stuff works, just so that you can get your work done, that's a, a fantastic start. And if you're spending all that time trying to figure out a hideous pile of, of test script, um, or somebody is telling you that the answer to all of your problems is writing more cucumber pictures, uh, hopefully you've got a, a few more um, things to consider before you make your decision. Um, and that's all I have. If there's any comments or questions, then, uh, please, please feel free. Torches to burn me down with. <laughs> Thanks. So, Scott, could you talk a little bit more about the lean startup concept as it applies to this? What are signs, for example, that you have reached a point where you come from, what, what do you call it, from the plot problem? What's it face for the solution <coughs> that you face? When are you reaching this? And uh, um, how can you recognize? What does it feel like, you mean? What does it feel like? And how does it relate to uh, it feels when like, you start It feels like demotivation. Journal? Feels like demotivation? It just feels like demotivation. That's a real downer. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> How so? How so? Seriously. Well, let me restate this then. It feels like a real downer. Yeah. <laughs> it just it just feels like that. Ugh, I don't want to have to rewrite this test. Ugh, I don't want to maintain this test. Uh, I don't want to have to work in this code. I mean, we've got code sometimes that's a week old that makes me want to, you know, call in sick <laughs> or apathetic. You know, but it, but I know that it just has to be dealt with. But it just it's you'll it's all in, it's all in emotional cues. I mean, you can certainly use some um, static analysis on code and design, but all that stuff doesn't matter until you put a designer, a really strong designer, in front of it and try to put it into perspective. I just say look for the look for the emotional cues and pay really good attention to them. Um, if you've got if you've been doing this for a while and you've got the sense like, oh, this is just, this is crap. Oh, but, you know, the, the gurus are telling me that this needs to be done, so I'll just do it. Well, there's value in that because that's formative learning, right? It's like uh, Daniel-san from Karate Kid, where Mr. Miyagi was telling him to, like, go paint the fence and wash the car and wax the car and sand the floor. It's like... You know, it was just doing these things to get muscle memory. You have to do formative learning at some point, and then at some point you have to really wonder whether or not what you're really, maybe Mr. Miyagi is really just using him as forced labor. I mean, at some point that is <laughs> not about this. But strictly speaking, if he has attachment to this being one way or another, he has a problem. But the thing is, so is, is every indication uh, that something feels like crap uh, when I don't want to work on this code, Am I feeling like this for the right reason, right? Uh, there must be invalid reasons why I feel that way, which doesn't necessarily mean I'm at the point where I can... So where that's, I that's, mitigated, that's mitigated by pursuing an ever more profound understanding of structural design. Because that, and also that structural design is... Once the, once the principles are, are... Once you have fluency with this you, and, and fluidity with it, you'll find that it's the same, uh, same principles for designing software. Uh, for designing a workflow, for designing a team, for 
I mean, everything that you do, it's all the same elemental principles. It's all just a DAO, man. Don't what? be attached. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> you, you're, you know, you can't get away from attachment. Not while you're a living human being. So, for the, for the moment, while you are still alive, <laughs> and have to deal with the, you know, the inconvenience of that. Um, <laughs> Lean on, lean on, um, lean on, lean on structural design principles. And if, if you don't know what they are, then then understand that that's just the point of software development history where we're at. I'd say just focus on focus on trying to see where things are difficult, and always remember that the more coupling you have over things that are difficult, your new realization, these epiphanies of oh my God, this could be so easy. But now I can't make that change because there's so many tests wrapped around this thing. That's a really, that's a moment of despondency. But it's not just tests either. Once you get there, you'll really see that structural design is, an, is, a, is, a, is a, an exercise in creating isolation and partitions so that you can make changes. Um, and there's a lot of things that we use a lot of in our work that fundamentally violate structural design. If you do Ruby on Rails, um, the active record framework is often used in a way that, that is fundamentally contradictory to good structural design principles. Okay, so but we're using it because we know that it does that, and we're making a reasonable bet and a trade-off and, and taking a risk. You say, we're going we're gonna to bend the rules here a little bit. The problem comes when you're doing it and not knowing that you're making a mistake, and not knowing what the repercussions are, and not planning ahead on, on how to, to unwind that. So the kind of down are like, Oh, I'm looking at this method, but I can't see it in context. I have no idea what I would have to do in order to really see it execute and do its That's thing, and examine, examine it. I don't know what triggers it's being called, don't know how to set up the data so I can play with it. I so the counterintuitive aspect of all this is that I'm suggesting something that um, the vast po part of our functional population in development hasn't seen and can't believe it, which is that you can have code that you can understand by glancing at it. And you take the time to structure it that way. And you take the time to consider usability and accessibility principles and learn to use pair programming as a user acceptability or user um, uh, over the, you know, the amenability to the cognitive functions that code has. Code has to get into your mind and turn into understanding. That code is either going to be user-friendly or user-hostile. So, um, we have a culture in software development that tends to not want to care about that because there's a lot of stimulation to be had by um, observing our code working. And really, you know, making code work is not a hard problem. I mean, if all we wanted was working code, we could send, you know, get relatively intelligent monkeys to make code work. The, uh, the money is in making code workable, meaning what are you doing to make the job of the next person that you're handing off to even easier? Or what are you doing at least to not make it difficult? And understanding that there's no excuse to be made either from industrial theory, from structural design theory, or even from social theory to allow you to make this cop out. You could see it as a moral issue. That's a little heavy handed, isn't it? Is that a downer as well? Bit of a downer. I was just wondering, you mentioned uh, working with a, a team where you know you're, you're trying to explain this to them that, that you know maybe they have too many tests, maybe they need to, to back up a little bit and make the code a little bit more fluent and easy to work with. And I guess you used the metaphor of sailing around the world, um, what does that look like, not so metaphorically? What does that, those, those conversations and that mentoring look like? How do you really difficult. Yeah, <laughs> that, it sounded like that. Um, really difficult. Um, there's an interpretation of Agile in, Ruby on, in the Ruby on Rails community. In fact, it's in a specific geographic area of the Ruby on Rails community that is very, very invested in a notion of perfect democratic rule of the software team. And 
when you are endeavoring to introduce ideas that are countercultural, counterintuitive, um, sometimes it comes with a little bit of exercise of authority. Sometimes it has to. Um, that's where it can be complicated and difficult. So, one of the things I think that I first clued into when I was on a project, I was on an Agile project in 2000, 2007 that could not fail. We had an awesome staff, an awesome team, well-known people, skilled people, and we failed, and we actually uh, got fired. So, I was always struggling um, as, the, as the chief of that project team with what I knew or what I felt about Agile in terms of I'm not really supposed to be authoritative. Um, and when I needed to, because the, our team culture was such that we rejected this, um, this kind of contract, uh, it would create all kinds of difficulties. And it, it ruined the relationships of people who started out on a software project as the best of friends and had known each other for years. And these are people we can, we don't really talk to each other anymore. Um, I would say that the only time that everybody on the team is equal is when nobody knows what to do next. <laughs> when nobody has a better idea, then everybody's equal. The moment you have a better idea show up, there, it just is, there, there's, it's just not perfect equality. So, so there's a delicate balance now of working with my perspectives of the necessity of directed authority and also the needs for self-organization. Um, and the really difficult thing is that I work in a part of the industry where the um, edicts of self-organization have been taking quite a bit of field, um, uh, more sway towards self-determination than, than uh, self-organization. As a, it's not really a workflow and, and a management technique anymore. It's more of a, a, a social entitlement problem. So, uh, if you're, you know, if you undertake this, expect some of those um, um, frictions. But what I said, what I meant about sailing around the world with him is. I have to do more work, I have to spend more time. I'm the mass, I'm the quality gate on everything. So we have to really seriously invest in understanding what managing cues means. And there's a really, I, I, one of my favorite books of the past couple of years is The Principles of Product Development Flow from Donald Reinertson. And I'll admit that I understand the first half of this book. And I'll probably take the rest of my life to understand the, the rest of it. Um, but it, it really talks about what you need to do to have quality in terms of managing work and process, but not from a Kanban capital K perspective. Um, but if you read the principles of product development flow and then read David Anderson's book, some, some interesting things and then put together momentum transfer and knowledge transfer and clarity. Uh, even actually, it was like this one little moment in David Anderson's Kanban book where he says, where he said, very, very bluntly that all of this was about knowledge transfer. He said it once and moved, moved right on. I wanted to get all the books in print and take it back and highlight them and redistribute them and say, yes, this is it. Um, you, you have to spend the time with the people doing the work. Not only reviewing the work, but also doing the rework so that you can have the object lessons doing this. It's not enough to say, tell somebody with authority you're doing this wrong. It's not enough to do that because it's irresponsible. It's irresponsible to people professionally. It's irresponsible to them psychologically. If you're going to take authority, um, and I like this title, Chief Engineer, and it's something to work, look into in terms of uh, Toyota's definition. Um, Toyota's book called uh, the Toyota Product Development System, not the TPS, but the TPDS that defines what a chief engineer is. Um, and I'm insulting that role, really, by taking it upon for myself. I hope it's just a temporary thing just to establish authority on my team. Um, but you, 
you have to work as the master teacher and, 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 and you have to set quality standards. I can't just tell somebody they're doing it wrong if I don't turn around and tell them exactly what it should be. That means I have to spend the time doing the review and also doing the rework. If you want to turn a team into you know, productivity here to productivity in order to you, you just really have to accept that you can get there, but there's some effort to be made. It's fun watching people come along, though. It's really fascinating to me to see because Kanban starts to make sense in this perspective. Actually, to help the Kanban. I mean, not to help the Kanban, but I mean. Um, sorry, David Anderson, if you're watching this. You know, I love you. <laughs> My God, if David Anderson is watching me, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be online, don't worry. <laughs> um, the, the amazing uh, reality of managing queues and batch size becomes crystal, crystal clear when you have master quality control flow game having work piled up in front of them. And you realize that the work that I'm working on reworking right now Somebody else is doing something else to that while I'm reworking. And you see very, very clearly whether or not you have work in process limits set explicitly, or whether you have them implicitly. You can kind of feel your, you can feel a work in process limit as an emotional response. It's a big downer. And the answer is to idle the team. It sounds overwhelming. Like you're it's totally overwhelming. But you know, how you, you know how you stop, stop being overwhelmed? You stop the, you shut off the input. You stop the flow. You tell the developers to stop contributing until we can catch up. And that just freaks my project manager clean out. But the other thing that I'm responsible for doing when this happens is having some work items that are completely, can be done completely independently of, of the main line of work that can be undertaken that also serve our longer term goals. So that can be separate projects for utilities, taking some, 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 some code that is common and, and, and forming frameworks out of them, um, or even having them work with me, or I, one guy just sat down, he's like, I don't know what to do, and there's no work. And I said, do you have a book? He's like, well, just read the book. <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty fantastic. You know, Sometimes you can find people on your team who don't read books, don't want to read books, will never read books. And I have a guy who's just like, I'll read this book. And it's like, that's a really complicated book. Are you sure you want to get into that? Maybe you'd prefer to write assembly language rather than reading that book. That's a really good book. <laughs> Domain driven design, by the way, Anna. Just, just, just be heady. So, um, all of these things that are sort of floating around on the outskirts of, of uh, core agile, um, things that are of a larger context, things that are from the, the, um, the lean tradition, they, well, I, I don't have to say lean already accounts for all the problems that we're just recognizing in Agile. When I was on struggling projects, I always found that the answers had already been, already been sort of documented and communicated. Um, it's just that there's a lot to put into place and to crystallize into a single understanding. Um, and when you start to put it all together, it actually comes together really nicely you'll have these really wonderful moments of really positive feedback about what you know about the methodology because you'll start to see these things crystallize and all of the principles and the practices are, are, are <coughs> related. Um, and you get a great deal of reinforcement by, by um, I think, going from, I'm not going to say do lean, not agile. I, I do really mean that. <laughs> um, but that's impossible anyway. You've done agile already. You'll always do it. But look into look into the rest of it. You know, the world of software development is, is incredibly huge. The world of human endeavor uh, and workflow management and um, uh, uh, collaboration is much much richer than what we can scratch the surface with agile. What the hell was your question? You <laughs> answered. I uh, no. I mean, I think that the I, I was more curious about that overwhelming sense of you know you become the bottleneck to uh, to quality control as the team kind of as you catch up with with what's going on in an entire code base and you know what does 
what does that look like in an organization? How does the organization actually accept that? Looks like that? a bottleneck. It, that's where the elephant comes in. That's when you get <laughs> thick skin when you tell your project manager that the guys are sitting idle reading books. And really, I'm not even joking. You need that if you want to do that, I think. Yeah. You need that if you want to really, really do this with wind yeah. limit stuff. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I gained the, uh, the confidence uh, of my project manager. I, have, I, I, don't, I wish I could go back <laughs> Of all the little moments, but it was a million, you know, moments in time, seconds where confidence was built for Wait, this approach. I, I guess the question is, how did you get away with it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask. <laughs> the question was, what was the literal equivalent of the figure of uh, sailing to the end of the world? Literally, you have to be able to do the work, and you have to be able to do it um, at a level that is sufficiently masterful that you can teach it to everybody else. Oh, and you have to be, you have to be willing and able to teach. But that's it, I do, I do the software work that they do. And if, and if I need to help them see a mistake, then I rework their work so that we can go over it. And we create a team environment where um, Everything is optimized around if we need to do an inspection, if we need to deal with a problem with a mistake, it's right there on the spot. We have a challenge uh, in our organization because we're growing so fast that we can't get um, conference rooms with projectors booked out fast enough. It takes days. So I bought a projector. Um, and when maintenance wasn't booking, I connected it to the ceiling. Um, and now we have. Uh, instant group code reviews every time that we need to do it. Um, and that's, you know, not money that, it's, I, it's money I wish I was spending on, on other things, but at the same time, it's like, this has been a fantastic investment. It's paid off in spades because the acceleration, this is a good, it's a really tumultuous um, transformation or period to go through. So anything that can be, any investment that can be made to accelerate the amount of time, that, or uh, uh, shorten the amount of time you spend in this pain is probably a good thing. So you really just have to, if you're gonna tell somebody like, you can't just be a critic basically. You can't stand by at the World Cup and say, I can say a lot about better than you can. Like you gotta get up there and, you know, and actually be able to demonstrate. But if you can't demonstrate what's better anyway, then it won't matter because you don't really have an opinion. You're not going to look at the code and say, hey, this, there's a mistake here. It's very subtle. You can't see it, but we need to rework this. And even when you do it, even when you rework these subtle mistakes, because design mistakes are happening usually at a very subtle level, and they're happening pervasively. That's why we're not dealing with them. We underestimate them because in the, in the instance of a mistake, it seems negligible. But the instance of a mistake is just one instance of something that's happening in every piece of code that you have. <coughs> it's just a, you know, a local optimum problem where you're, you're, looking, you're looking at a small scope and you see a little problem, you don't matter. And you're looking at another small scope, you see another problem. But it's all like, well, they're all little problems. But all together they form, they're the side effect of really bad habits. But you can't see the mistakes to begin with. Um, there's just really not a lot you can do. Have you uh, ever reached a school point you can actually reproduce yourself into other people? So take into other people? No, no, reproduce just like sort of, you know, like you can become a bottleneck, but you just sort of, you know, reproduce yourself into others. And, and, yes, you know, uh, yes, it's, 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 it's happening right now in my team, as a matter of fact. It's very slow, though. It's very, very slow. The fantastic thing is now that the team is seeing what the repercussions are of not really, really trying hard to get it right, that they see that once I become the bottleneck, that it affects them, it affects their ability to continue and to pursue, they end up having a new motivation. Um, that was something that I didn't really, I didn't really thought I was going to see. Um, once they start to understand what the effects are on me, and then what, how that re rebounds and affects the team, um, the system starts to, starts to get a little bit more balanced and a little better. 
However, right now I've got a, just a massive pile of defects um, sitting in front of me, and a massive, an ever-growing pile of defects that are coming into our, our inbox, into our process every day. <coughs> Mostly because we had to we had to rush to meet a deadline, and we paid the trade off. We rushed for two weeks to meet a deadline, and we've got four weeks of rework. So, but my project manager also trusts um, in what we're doing and how much the team is visibly coming along in their attitudes and their abilities um, that we're being given the opportunity to get it right. And we're very quickly, very quickly, through six months, um, have established um, a culture for getting it right, but not only that, actually understanding the underlying structural theory of why this is economically significant for us. Um, and that's quite pleasing, because that's what got us the permission, the privilege, to undertake rewriting of some of the most critical systems that we run in our organization. Um, and without that, and without the new social contracts that are involved in getting it right, it wouldn't have happened. But I can't, I can't reproduce myself yet. I'm really hoping to. I, mean, I, I know the people in my organization who are most likely. Um, and, you know, can't do anything as, you can't do anything uh, but throw yourself at people who you can immediately see are just going to soak up everything like a sponge. So it's uh, kind of, you know, it's a, it's a moral obligation. Um, do you have any specific references or, or directions to look at to improve knowledge of, uh, of software architecture or software design, um, like down the uh, software craft craftsmanship path, or give it any other ideas? You, you mentioned that it's a skill that's lacking, but if yeah, only I mean, I think you know, the solid principles from Bob Martin are a really great place to start. Um, the rest of the principles, like. Oh, uh, Things that you can find in domain driven design are significant as well. Um, in the end, you're, you're, you know, even, even the solid principles are, are five principles taken from earlier, earlier, some of them are from earlier work, some of them are, 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 are Bob's clarifications. Um, but there are many, many, many more um, that all have to be um, all have to be taken into consideration. And what's fascinating about design principles is that in any given situation that you find yourself, the principles will apply uh, to different degrees, leading to different decisions. Um, and so it's really dangerous to just say, hey, that violates blah, blah, blah. You can't do that. You, you, you have to really have such a level of fluency that you understand the trade-offs. But the fluency, all of this really comes down to how difficult is this going to be to change our minds? Uh, Martin Fowler had an article a number of years ago about reversibility as an architectural quality. And it's just about that. And that comes down to partitioning your software. Um, and partitioning is a strange thing to get your head around because it means that you have to violate the do not repeat yourself principle sometimes to move data across partitions and duplicate it. So you'll find really interesting contradictions in the principles um, that cause contention on teams um, when you learned just a few of the principles and have only applied them in, in, in very few circumstances. That's why I'm saying we've got, you know, not a lot of people alive who really have endeavored to understand software design. So it's, you know, still only becoming I don't think I'm a uh, I don't think I'm a master designer by any means, but I can see light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, it's a little disheartening to think that that it takes so long to get there, and that there are so few people on the uh, presently on the path. And at the same time, it's a dead simple path to walk. It's just making sure you hold the line and continue to study and uh, and continue to have good conversations with. with Just wondering.
and what type of percentage of automatic test code you still have in your current system? Uh -huh. Or in your current project? Versus, versus production code? Yeah. Small fraction. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Counterintuitive. <laughs> um, I was once on a project where we, I'm sure people have done this at some point in the journey, their journey to Agile. When it was early on and we just started the work, and we kept a, we kept a scorecard on our, <coughs> on our board of the number of lines of code, the number of lines of code we had in, in uh, fitness, the number of lines of code we had in uh, end unit, the number of lines of code we had in, in JavaScript testing, and the number of functional lines of code. And I remember there was a really a day where we calculated, like, we had, we have four times more test code than production code. We rock. <laughs> and it's just so naive. Um, and that bulk of test code, especially the integration test code at that level, would, ended up killing us. So we rely a lot on um, semi-automated testing. Um, we have, we have uh, hopefully the right amount, but no more of test code to sustain our, um, basically to keep it in our minds so that we can look at the test code and, and refresh and understand what the system does. But we're not going after every edge case in, in automated testing. Uh, we're not going after um, every, you know, we have very, very loose use of, of mock objects. Um, We use a uh, style of test authorship such that if the tests can't be read by a non-programmer, we rework them until they can. Um, and we end up putting a lot of focus there. And like I said, we backstop this. We backstop this with spot checking. We can automate the system to control it to do just about anything we want. So there are rare things that we might go over really quickly just in, in automating it. The fun part about that, I'm sorry, I'm going to go off topic. The fun part about creating a, a system under control is that our customers of our system, which are internal customers, consumers, they also can access our controls and disposition our systems in ways to facilitate their testing that they're not able to do with other other teams that they work with, um, or other or the, uh, other teams, other organizations, outside organizations. They can switch our systems from, if it's a web app, well, I'll give it to you this way. If you're testing a web app, and you have to go behind the scenes to some code to get some data in the database, and then you test the web app, that system is arguably not under control. Because wherever you're testing from, <coughs> you're testing in a web surface, you should be able to control the, the disposition of that application from that surface. Meaning, you should be able to drop the database from a URL. <coughs> which should suggest that you shouldn't deploy those things in the production system. <laughs> <laughs> but it also suggests that you have some automation of uh, test automation that happens post deployment to verify that the controls that you don't want in production are not there. And that opens up testing to a broader concept, to a broader, uh, a broader perspective. And that's a difficult thing for people to understand, especially programmers, because for us it's well, why would I do that? I can just crank this out in Ruby and shove some data in the database. It's like, well, if you can exercise, if you go through the meaningful exercise of trying to control your system directly from the level that you're using it, you'll see design problems. You'll see clarity problems. You, would ine you will inevitably surface problems that you would not have seen otherwise that were going to be the difficulties that you were going to have uh, later. And usually later means at a point in time right before you're about to go live, and you really, really don't want to have any difficulties. I'm guessing it's uh, we're running late on time. If you want to uh, talk with uh, Scott a little bit more, I'm sure he'll make himself available in the hallways, et cetera. Or am I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, sure, yeah. Sure. <laughs> anyway, um, on behalf of Vancouver, thank you very oh, much. Wow, thanks. For, uh,